just love that new recording. Yeah. Kia ora kato, nā mai hari mai. So greetings and welcome to this month's EHF Live Investor Session. So Edmund Hillary Fellowship is a collective of entrepreneurs and investor change makers who want to make an impact globally from Aotearoa New Zealand. So these are informal interviews and are planned in a way that you'll leave here probably after the 60 minutes, hopefully feeling that you know the investor fellow on a bit of a personal level and what their intentions are for New Zealand. So this month you'll hear from Mark Velosky from NZBC. He's pretty lucky to get that name. When I saw that he had registered as fund as NZBC, I was like, you lucky man, how come no one in New Zealand thought of that? Um, it's a new fund and it's run by operators. And so Mark will take you through and explain why they're sort of saying that it's the first fund in New Zealand that's run by operators. But first, a bit of housekeeping, as I said before, this is recording. Stay on mute unless you're asking some Q&A or put those questions in the chat. And um, feel free, if you do need to leave, just you can sort of give a wave out or just say thanks. And um, we can send out the, all of the videos and stuff will be live on the website so you can see all past and next events that are coming up. So Mark, how about you just give us a little brief background on you as the person before we go into the fund? Who you are and where you come from? Sure. Hi, Michelle. Uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, hello to everybody. Uh, thank you for showing up and um, being interested in what we have to share here today. Um, yeah, my, you know, my background, um, actually, I was originally born in Ukraine, uh, moved to America when I was, when I was nine. And um, yeah, I spent a lot of time moving to different parts of the States, lived, was in a lot of different um, uh, places in America and um, studied biology at Princeton. Um, then I spent some time in Africa actually teaching um, kids using my biology knowledge to teach kids about global health um, and used used a game approach to teach them about malaria infectious disease got into this whole space of, of using games for education and um, went off to Oxford started a PhD in, in um, computer science and was sort of teaching kids computer science on the side how to code basically and um, that, that became my first company basically teaching kids the fundamentals of how computers worked using using games <clears throat> using um a hardware product called the raspberry pi they were basically building their own computers and learning to code and um that became my first company we got some funding i dropped out of the phd moved to san francisco and um yeah basically started this company called piper and um spent basically five years running the company we raised about 15 million dollars and um yeah i exited the company about three years ago and um on that journey you know i learned um, a lot about both the kind of hardware uh, education space, um, how to build a company. Um, we, we were sort of at a time um, where a lot of these kind of learn to code trends were, were really hot. So, um, you know, we got a lot of traction. Um, we shipped over 100,000 of these computers. Um, Steve Wozniak endorsed the product. Elon Musk actually bought some for his kids. So it was quite an exciting time. And um, after, after I finished that, um, it sort of Left the company, um, exited it to investors who are now running it with a focus more on schools than on consumer. Um, I started thinking about what to do next. And I spent some time traveling, spent some time in China, and um, actually was thinking of starting a new company. I, I did start a new company um, in a similar space. And the intention there was to teach kids even younger how to code. And I wanted to build that company basically with a remote first focus because it was really expensive to build the initial company in San Francisco. Um, you know, our, Burn rate kind of at 20, 25 people was around um, 200, 300K a month USD, right? So it was, it was a really high burn rate. And what I realized is you can actually get to like a tenth of that burn rate um, if you were to build a fully a remote first company. And so we're looking to do that. Um, and I was thinking of places where I would kind of, uh, I guess, I guess, base myself and learn about EHF through that. I was looking at different places in the world. And um, New Zealand seemed like a great, you know, it sort of seemed like a very, I didn't know very much about the country, but um, it seemed like you know, a very, very kind of great uh, place, very stable. Um, uh, and uh, right, that, that was right around like Donald Trump in America, right? So, so I think a lot of people probably were looking for, for, for other places um, to, to sort of maybe go. And um, yeah, I applied to EHF. Kind of somehow I got I got to the country a day before the border closed last year, okay. and um, 
basically he asked me last, last year, like, you know, working on the second company and then um, thinking through about how I wanted to engage in New Zealand. And one of the things that I realized was, um, you know, there's, there's a ton of really great, um, really smart, really ambitious uh, people, founders, individuals here in New Zealand who, um, who, who are looking to, to build really, you know, amazing companies and make great impact. Um, but a lot of times they were just actually um, lacking the mentorship or lacking the support. Um, the things that we would take for granted in California and Silicon Valley, um, kind of knowing how to, uh, everything from, you know, how do you, the, the very, very details of like, how do you, I don't know, um, uh, how, do you, how do you launch a product to more like high level stuff? Like how do you structure a board or how do you do a fundraiser? Um, everything from like, yeah, from the very small to the very strategic, a lot of that, from what I saw, a lot of the mentorship was lacking. And um, founders here, they would get initially funded through the angel ecosystem. A lot of that would would come from, you know, friends and family. And, and there, there was a big, there, there was a big um, angel ecosystem in New Zealand. Um, and a lot of those folks, um, you know, write the first checks and take the first risk in the companies. But a lot of times they're not necessarily um, operators. A lot of times they don't necessarily have the right kind of experience to, to help founders go on that journey, give them the right advice. And so we saw an opportunity to basically create, um, yeah, you know, and in, in the Valley, this is a very typical thing. Most great funds are actually run by operators. They're actually run by people who've started companies, who've sold companies, who've, who've gone on the journey. And so because of they can better relate to and empathize with an entrepreneur. And so that's, that was the idea. It was basically to create a similar um, fund here in New Zealand and, uh, you know, to, to work with the best um, entrepreneurs here and, and to basically give them our experience and give them our um, you know, piece of our mind and, 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 and hopefully help them, you know, expand abroad, scale into the U.S., uh, attract follow-on funding. Um, yeah, that's how hmm. it kind of... That's kind of how you decided to start it. Exactly. And also noticed here in the room, you've actually got some of your supporters. Do you want to introduce them and just say what their role is inside the fund with you? Oh yeah, you know, there's actually quite a few folks. Also, so AJ and Glenn are um, are my two uh, my two partners, and uh, AJ was actually one of our first investors in Piper, and he's been a great um, you know a, a great person to work with, and um, just just a really nice guy, re really helpful, um, really knowledgeable, and, um, and 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 you know, when I told him about this idea, he was really interested in basically engaging with more founders. Um, and I think what, what we all kind of love doing is, um, yeah, it was just working with, with early, early stage founders. And so we saw an opportunity to, to really be helpful. And then he, um, he had a friend, Glenn, who, um, who, 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 who ran a part of Google Brain for, for over a decade. And they've co-invested into a bunch of companies together. And, um, and Glenn actually has some family in New Zealand. He's invested in some companies in New Zealand sort of independently. So AJ thought of Glenn and said, hey, you know, you, you've done some stuff in New Zealand, Mark's in New Zealand, um, what sort of combine forces and um, yeah, do something together. And so, and it's interesting because I think we all bring a different, a different um, kind of uh, set of expertise here. You know, I think, you know, Glenn has the, the deep tech kind of Google background. AJ has the, he's worked, you know, spent over two decades or so at Merrill Lynch um, running the training desk there. And, um, and so, and, and I've kind of done, you know, the startup from the ground up. And so, um, you know, I think we all bring different different pieces to the puzzle to to help in whatever way we can. We we also have two um, venture partners. Uh, one of them is Vishal Chada, who's part of Cohort Six along with me, and another one is Jay Yu, who's actually um, you know a Kiwi uh, entrepreneur who exited his company last year and um, yeah is, is helping us. Nice, yeah. And so, how many of you are based in New Zealand? So you're actually here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Jay's also here. So two yeah, of us. Two of us so you're, you're based up in Auckland. Yeah, no, and I'm sure. I'm sure. I know. I'm sure. Glenn and AJ will be very happy to be based here once the border opens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bet. Um, yeah. So most of the time when we've been interviewing the fellows, they've been offshore. So we're quite lucky that Mark's actually here in New Zealand. So if any of you want to connect in person and have a coffee, feel free to to ping him, and I'm sure he'll be happy to do that. Um, so just moving into the fund then, what types of things do you plan on investing in? What sort of verticals and kind of like, give us the sort of the quick and dirty of the, the metrics that you want to be looking for and the check sizes and where you want to play in the marketplace. Sure. Yeah, well, um, 
historically New Zealand has had um, a lot of B2B SaaS companies and deep tech companies, um, certainly not a lot of consumer. Um, so I think uh, for us, we don't see ourselves being any, you know, focusing on any specific, specific se sector because we, we don't think there's actually that many companies um, coming out of New Zealand every single year. It's just, you know, four and a half million people here. Um, so, so, so we think uh, we don't need to focus on any sector, but um, we probably will because of those dynamics and historically it's been the case we probably will focus you know we'll have a lot of investments in those two areas but we're, we're open to to sort of any um any areas really and both Glenn and aj's um angel investing portfolio spans the range of you know pretty much all all sectors whether it's health tech or or, or yeah consumer or deep tech so so yeah so so we don't see ourselves being sector agnostic, uh, you know, sector specific. Um, I think in terms of, yeah, stages are very early stage, um, kind of uh, pre-revenue, sort of like pre-seed around all the way through series A. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, just, just kind of starting getting, getting, getting um, connected with the founder as early as possible and helping them kind of at those earliest stages. I think a lot of times um, you know, what we've seen is sometimes if they get, um, started with, with angels very early a lot of times you know they, they do tend to give up more of their cap table or more more board control things like that and so um sometimes we want to basically you know help them yeah make sure the company's structured well from the beginning so they can grow it will you be doing um follow-on rounds yeah for sure um yeah we, we have about half the fund allocated for follow-on so um we'll probably invest into at least one follow round of every company Okay. Of, of, sorry, of, of the top, the top, like the yep. top, the top third companies that yeah, who, who we think are. Kind so, of have you done any investments today? Yeah, we we've done one one investment today. We've invested into a company called Piper Vision. It's uh, actually um, this proprietary technology for fog clearance at airports. So apparently, fog uh, prevents uh, you know planes from landing, it hurts visibility, and they can clear fog and like. 10 minutes and it's clear for two hours. So it's a great value proposition for airports, a huge, you know, a huge, huge problem, a uh, very big market. And so um, the, the founders, you know, super, super experienced in the space. And so, yeah, that was our first investment. Um, just, just, just a small check to get, to get started. Um, and then we have a few more that we're actively sort of in, in talks with and probably will, will close in the next, in the next you know, month or so. And so how are you partnering with other investors? You know, like how are you kind of playing in the New Zealand ecosystem? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, um, Michelle, I have to thank you for this because you, 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 you gave me that invite to the, um, to the Wahiki conference. And um, yeah, I, I really appreciate that. You know, the, there was a, basically an event of all New Zealand investors and about a month ago in Wahiki and I met, you know, most of the people who are playing in the ecosystem and um, who also, it's really interesting, right? Because it's like it's like they all fit in like one very small room. <laughs> it was like it was yeah. like a very cordial, very 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 friendly group of folks, and um, it was great to meet everybody. And I met a lot of folks um, from N N NZGCP, the New Zealand Growth Capital Partners, and NZTE, um, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise. And I think Mike Hanna is here actually from yep, NZTE. Here he is. And um, and uh, all these organizations are there to basically uh, help companies at the different stages, you know, grow and move forward. And, um, and it's actually been surprising, right, to, to see that government. Or it's, I mean, it's surprising for me as an American to see that government organizations are actually so involved and 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 quite helpful. Um, and founders really uh, find find you know find it work, uh, great to work with them. So um, yeah, I mean, being, just being connected to to all these folks. I mean, we're basically understand that. Because it's such a small market, everybody um, kind of sees all the deal flow, yep. and everyone um, is kind of you know you have to kind of play well together with everyone and um, and support each other. So so yeah. So how do we work with everyone? I think I think we just yeah we just support everyone. And we we lend expertise where we can, try to be helpful, and um, yeah, and and co invest. Mm. And so just on that summer, because I was going to ask you about that. What other differences have you seen or? What were some of kind of like the metadata metrics and um, observations that you saw about the New Zealand uh, sort of you know early stage investment scene compared to overseas? Like, and you know, where do you see us in the um, the cycle of mm. the of of the sort of investment route compared to right. offshore? Yeah, well, so I mean, my kind of understanding of the ecosystem is um, 
there, there's been sort of um, this kind of initial stage, um, maybe like about 10 years ago, there was a bunch of these VC kind of funds that, that were formerly PE funds that went in, kind of tried, tried their luck. Um, a lot of them didn't really work out that well. Um, and, and, and sort of at that stage, uh, I, think, I think the government was trying to figure out how do, you, how do we foster this, this early stage ecosystem? And they um, you know, started this thing called the Aspire Fund. And basically it matches angel funding. So that allowed angel checks to any angel rounds to be basically, um, to be sort of uh, almost kind of you know, doubled and sometimes um, to increase in size and to help the ecosystem, the early ecosystem blossom. And I think off the back of that, um, you know, just recently they they introduced this, this elevate fund, which invests into it's a fund to fund invest into funds for kind of later stage um, funds because you know I guess kind of yeah high level government sees that there's a lot of early stage companies now, and I think um, I heard some statistic that uh, there's sort of as much early stage deal flow as you know, in New Zealand as there's in Australia, and folks like folks like Blackbird, which is a Australian. Um, we see we see, we see fun that you know they've come over here to look to look at that I look at early stage deal flow and they have an office here permanently so um so, so I think um I mean I mean yeah I think like compared to compared to startup hubs like uh like San Francisco um I, I think you know it's still it still has a ways to go it's, it's definitely mm -hmm. still a pretty nascent ecosystem I mean in terms of like the Valuations at early at early stage rounds. I think uh, what we generally see is they're generally um, about thirty percent or so lower than the value. But that's definitely, I mean, it'll probably it'll probably change, right? Because with all these dynamics, with more capital coming into the country, I think I think that'll even out. Okay, so just to move back on to the um, you are a operator run fund, mm -hmm. right? And sort of that's kind of the branding and the, the story out there. Just dive into it a little bit more deeper about those skills that you feel that you and the team will add to the, the founders that you're investing in. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so yeah, it, it again, it comes down to, um, you know, the fundamentals of the company, things around how do you, um, you know, how, how do you think through ESOPs or how do you structure a board or how do you think about, um, yeah, like, you know, the pioneers of the company throughout the history of the company um to thinking through strategic investors right a lot of the companies you know we're talking to they're actually a lot of them have offers from strategic investors right that, that's like an example of something where on the face of it it might seem great to um you know to get money from somebody who could potentially acquire you but th th there's a lot of strings attached with that money and um thinking through kind of who has leverage and what you're giving up and what what are they getting for for that money is um was actually like a nuanced question and I, I had experience with that for my first company, we were um we partnered with Mattel, um the biggest toy company in the world and you know did did some did some work with them and um yeah it, it, it was gnarly like it was it was gnarly like sort of negotiations it took like you know um <clears throat> like like six months to, to sort of figure it out and um. Uh, yeah, and 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 like again, on the face of it, it seemed like seemed like a great thing, but actually for the company, um, it it was sort of it was it wasn't super clear if we were getting a benefit. So like that that's just an example that like we're seeing that you know like, there's experience we can bring there uh, for New Zealand founders. I mean, and then that we also have a lot of um, we have sort of an advisory board of about fifty plus people who span all the industries, um, and you know we've put Emily from Hypervision in touch with. Um, Rohit, who who ran um, Uber Elevate, it was Uber's flying taxi division, um, to to talk through some regulatory stuff, and she had some questions. Like, th there's just sort of questions that founders might face here that they might not find the answers to immediately, kind of you know, in in their ecosystem here. And so um, it's those two things I think it's our our experience dealing with some of these more nuanced things, plus the ability to find experts. Um, those are the two ways we we help and work with founders. Mm, good, you know, good examples. Yeah, that's interesting. A uh, 50 plus kind of um, advisory board or, or sort of like a, a pool of people that you can call on for uh, differing skill sets and, and subsectors where they might have experience. Yeah, that's quite cool. Um, just now kind of looking, what else do you think you'll be doing in New Zealand? Like what kind of, what other activities? Because obviously these days it's more than just doing a fund. So mm. what other sort of um 
whether it's events or what is it that, what else are you going to give to the New Zealand ecosystem or plan to do while you're here? Or even what are you thinking about doing while you're here? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think um, the other thing that we're really interested in is engaging with uh, universities and, and helping build <clears throat> helping build that, in, that, that sort of that muscle for, for starting companies um, and even that mindset for starting companies from an early, from the earlier um, stage, right? A lot of entrepreneurs now are, uh, have either worked in the industry or have, um, yeah, have basically done done some work. Um, and in the U.S., there's quite a lot of folks starting companies right out of college, dropping out of college, dropping out of, of their PhD programs. Actually, Kyle's on the call, so, so so you know, Kyle's one of the examples of somebody in New Zealand. The rare example of somebody in New Zealand, um, you know, doing a company kind of. Uh, I I did finish though. Uh, it's very important to my supervisor. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but, but doing something off the back of of just of just um, you know, getting your degree. So, I think um, New Zealand, you know, has uh, top universities globally, and there's a lot of folks coming abroad, uh, coming across to New Zealand um, to to study here. And, and I mean, now the border's closed; it, it, it it's less, but. Um, I think that there's just yeah a big talent, a pool of talent there that's um, that, that can be, that can be harnessed and leveraged. Um, and uh, you know I've spent some time talking to University of Canterbury and actually Paul is on this call. Paul Spence, um, he 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 runs Think Lab, which is their um, incubator. So we've been looking at doing some events with them, some hackathons. Um, we've been talking to University of Auckland uh, and also AUT um, to both basically do events, talk to talk to students, um, do fireside chats. Um, we do, we also done a couple of fireside chats with um, NZTE, um, with some of their companies. So, so it's, it's basically, yeah, it's just um, kind of funding expertise, um, talking on, on, on things that interest people, um, basically showing people there's, there's, there's um, you know, for the early the, for university students, showing them there's, there's other paths besides just getting a job. Um, mm. There's other opportunities that could actually you know, allow you to learn a lot faster, um, engage in more, and more, far more interesting things that you would in a job. And um, yeah, and then just kind of working with, with existing kind of organizations to do, to do events, yeah. speaking things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. That's actually a good point you raised there because we've got a bit of flush of that early stage money in New Zealand at the moment. And there's the lack of the companies coming out of the universities to invest in at that slightly more deeper tech level. Mm -hmm. What I've found from listening to all you investor fellows is that that shift can happen quite quickly from us actually mm -hmm. getting a huge growth of entrepreneurs coming through. And it's just a matter of a, either a university cycle or a um, almost like a, a fund cycle as well of a couple of the new funds that are all popping up and stuff. And I think it's going to be good. It's a, it's kind of will be that pull effect because everyone you see, there's been a couple of articles in the last few weeks about, you know, uh, investors investing in companies that don't deserve money but that will write itself and I think that's quite good and I think because uh, you a lot of you have been talking about you've seen it in your own home countries where it has righted itself and quite quickly I, I think it's really great and I know we've got Gina that was on here as well from the academy and I love how they're doing their courses outside of the universities I just think that's great that breaks that same mold and that's another quick way of getting more entrepreneurs up and out Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think I think hitting the universities and the innovative incubators and the innovative um, uh, hubs is a, a really great way to sort of branch out. So um, just conscious of our time now. So any questions from the floor? Does anyone else have anything else for Mark or actually even of his team? You can either, because it's a small group, feel free to raise your hand and unmute um, yourselves and ask away. Go, Lily. Uh, kia ora koutou. I am Lily from Tulaga Bay Innovation. I'm all about Indigenous empowerment, okay? Our Māori people in Aotearoa. One of the reasons why I joined the EHF Fellowship was because we lacked expertise in various areas. We lacked the ability to access resources, aka capital, because many of our Māori businesses and organisations did not fit the criteria, okay? Uh, I won't go into the reasons, you can imagine half of them. Anyway, um, there are many wonderful multi businesses and organizations that I work with. 
but there is one key thing. We are aware that there are many investors coming to our lands. We're aware that there is lots of money out there and wanting to be pumped into our, our beautiful lands. What we need to do is ensure that we build certain relationships with the various investors. It's not all about the carrot and the money. Um, if you can, it would be nice if, um, and sorry if this sounds rude, but, but it, it, it's so you understand how our people on the ground think, um, that it's very important to build a relationship, to build that trust, because it is a long-term venture that, that you, you know that, that this is what we do today affects our next generations so um if any investors would be interested in actually meeting with some of our uh people or being or being welcomed onto our marae to get the traditional cultural understanding of what we're about and maybe even meeting some of our Māori organisations, I'd be more than happy to organise some type of event if, if you have an appetite for that. Um, because I think with the fellowship, it is solving the global problems of the world from New Zealand as an incubation nation. That means our people of the land really have to be partake in that as well. If you truly want to um, really get in deep with, with Aotearoa, um, so, I welcome anyone who'd, who'd like to um, meet and discuss further. Yeah, Thanks, thank you. Lily. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, have a have have a, have um have a think about it. Have you already engaged in any Maori businesses in the New Zealand ecosystem? Um, yeah. So 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 um, you, you know we have a lot of folks emailing us and and, and sending sending pitches. So, so I'm, I'm not sure if any of them are you know explicitly Maori, but um, you know, we, we have engaged with, with a few folks um, in the community. Um, Jace, um, uh, who, who's a fellow in, in C6, sort of been uh, you know, my, my personal advisor just with, with Mary related things. And actually, um, I, met, I met Lily in, um, in Auckland um, about six months ago, and we were sort of initially brainstorming, we're still at that point brainstorming the idea for the fund, and we were thinking of actually bringing um, foreign entrepreneurs, like sort of, yeah, like, like American entrepreneurs to New Zealand. And that was the initial idea. Um, and lot, and the, some of the feedback that she gave us at the time was, um, you know, that there's actually a lot of talent here. Um, so why don't you focus here? And so that's how that actually helped um, change our direction and, and, and change the folks at the fund. Um, and um, so that, 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 that was really great. And actually, um, yeah, we would sort of be really interested I think Lily and um, yeah, and, and sort of engaging if, if there's if there's companies looking for funding, um, in uh, in in your network and in your community, we would be um, yeah very happy to engage with that. Um, so so yeah definitely, and I, th I think I think more 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 broadly right more um, more more high level I think um, the the Maori um, culture of New Zealand is actually something really special and something really unique about New Zealand, and everyone who I talked to um, abroad is actually like really surprised and how because of that Maori connection, um, I think it makes New Zealanders a lot more open, a lot more accepting um, compared, compared to a lot of other places in the world. And so that kind of um, mindset, I think, is is, is perfect. Um, this perfect kind of fertile soil for for, for a lot and a lot of innovation to to bloom and grow here. Um, and yeah, so, so, so I think that, that that's a really special thing that needs to be treasured. Um, yeah. And we would be, yeah, we would be very happy to, to work with Maori um, founders and the local, um, the local iwi. Cool. I'm just going to put Mike Hannah on the spot here from NZTA because they actually have a Maori team in investment and also on the business side. So Mike, I'll get you to just to talk about the Maori investment team and how you operate. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. So we, um, we at NZT, we've got a Māori investment team with Māori investment managers who, um, who help uh, Māori companies, um, whether it be Māori um, exec suite um, people or shareholders. Um, you know, we help those companies um, raise capital. So we've got a dedicated team involved to the Māori economy because it's a, you know, it's a massive part of Aotearoa. Um, and we yeah, we are dedicated to helping that um, that part of the economy go forward. So we 
um, we do quite a lot with with Maori startups um, and trying to raise capital throughout New Zealand. Yeah. So, and you've got a team that's spread out throughout New Zealand as well, aren't they? Because Lily's based in Gisborne. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. We've got a few in Auckland. Um, you know, uh, in Wellington, um, and but we're represented right throughout the country. Um, yeah. yeah. Cool. Thanks. So, Lily, you might want to. Um, Mike can probably just ping you in in the chat your email address and vice versa his email address and he can put you in touch with people inside NZT if you haven't already met that team so that you can see what's available to help you get investment ready in that regard. That's great. Thanks for that. Um, and, and, and just to make you aware, um, it's... We, we, we know a lot of the issues and why why um, it's difficult to access and part of that is is from the expertise level which is why we actually we actually have an answer to the solution to connect our in particular startups to impact investment um, so so yes I, I can certainly flick my my uh, um, uh, email to share our our solution Kia ora. Thanks, Lily. Any other questions for, for Mark or his team? You, um, yeah, do, do, do you think it'd be good, maybe, maybe Glenn or AJ can actually talk about it themselves and kind of how yeah, they see New Zealand, yeah, given they that they're both. both yeah. uh, I, I have a question. Oh, yeah. um, so as part of Civ Academy's work, I've been going out into the industry predominantly into the tech and startup world um, to really hear about what training needs are out there from a, um, I guess, a capability point of view and often more the kind of uh, soft skills, but also from a technical point of view. And something that I heard from a very senior kind of CTO level um, <clears throat> people and a bunch of Wellington businesses at this point is the lack of... Um, very high level, highly technical, highly complex engineering type um, jobs and opportunities for people to really upskill at the very senior end, I think across the board, but um, in, in this instance at a very senior level, um, I think partly due to market size, the opportunities just not being uh, really there compared to you know, many other places in the world. Um, with the expertise that you bring from an operational level, do you think there's something from a capability point of view that you could do or that should be done, whoever it may be done by and with, um, in terms of bringing those high level, complex kind of um, technical jobs and opportunities for people here? So your question is more about uh, how do we help um bring that expertise or help existing kind of folks level yeah yeah i don't think it's yeah i think it's more about the upskilling rather than bringing the expertise oh, right. what mm -hmm. i've heard from folks is um obviously we're not able to bring talent in internationally as easily at the moment and for forever it's been an issue around how do we upskill people locally so um yeah is there a way that you can imagine bringing some of those opportunities for for those really kind of gnarly jobs uh to to really yeah, lift people's capabilities and capacities in that space. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th I think probably Glenn would probably speak more to that and, and have more experience there. But I, I think it's 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 a it's a global. Um, I mean, there's just a global sort of um, shortage of, of of top tech talent in general. That's why um, Facebook and Google and all these companies they they pay exorbitant salaries to the top folks just because um, th those are skills are such high demand. Right, you actually need to put in the years to get to that level, and because so mm -hmm. few people were there in the beginning. Um, you just have fundamentally a lack of, of, of experts. Um, I think, um, yeah, I, I, it's, it's hard. It's hard to kind of do that without doing the work. I mean, I think we have folks in the network who we're happy to put people in touch with. Uh, there's actually one EHF fellow, Jeremy um, Ginsberg, um, who, who's actually based in Auckland, who's been sort of, um, yeah, kind of is, is working as a CTO in residence for MOAC. And um, has been kind of helping companies specifically in that um, in that direction, uh, but yeah, it's, it's it's hard to sort of do. It's kind of maybe Glenn, you have more thoughts on that. Yeah, sure, a couple of thoughts. Um, so I'm Glenn, by the way. So I'm kind of the third the third leg of the stool with AJ and Mark. Um, and I come from a deep tech background. I'm originally a chip designer back in the '90s, and then uh, network infrastructure, and then machine machine learning, artificial intelligence stuff at Google for 11 years, and um, data center build out stuff. And um, 
I've heard this comment a lot. If you look at the Google scale of the T levels, you know, like T6 is like a staff engineer, seven is a senior staff, eight's a principal, nine's the distinguished engineer. Like, I think there's a cut point people have said, like, if you get to, I don't know whether it's seven or what, but where, you know, if you're in New Zealand or Australia, even you may have to go to the States or go to Britain to kind of keep going. I think that's what you're talking about. And so I think the competitive pressures will over time do it. And I saw it at Google, I, with the Australia office at Google, for example, in Sydney, I helped support them a little bit. And um, we saw more and more career paths open up there. There was an interesting promotion, and a little, little bit a little bit more promotion dynamics rather than actual work, but they kind of go hand in hand. And there was like a promotion dynamic where some of the outposts at Google, where we had people in Poland and you know or all around the world, had a hard time getting enough critical mass to get promoted. Um, and, and once they got enough people at the T6 level, they could get some promotions going and then T7, and then they got a couple T8s and then it kind of like caught on and they were able to get other people up with them. And then those, those things are kind of at parity now, but, uh, and then with the promotion then comes the ability to sort of vie for deeper responsibility on the tech side. So I think it is, it's probably an obvious answer, but I think it's a gradual process. The competitive nature, man, to hire someone in Silicon Valley right now, like a T8 level person, you know, is like probably a $300,000 a year, you know, a, a nut to crack, you know, because you're competing with Facebook or or Google, and then they're they're off, actually offering that kind of salary plus um, plus plus stock. So you know, <laughs> so, so so what that does is it 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 will force entrepreneurs to look at that equation and move deeper tech roles and responsibilities to places like New Zealand that can deliver it. So I I think it's for sure going to come. It's going to equal. It's just a question of time and how many people are coming out of the universities there that will be able to, and other companies that will be able to, to pick up that work in Ramadan. Nice. That's great. Yeah. Um, AJ, did you want to say anything? Introduce yourself to the group and how you're yes, supporting well, Mark? Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. I feel uh, like an EHF fellow myself, given the number of these sessions I have attended. So, so thank you for <laughs> letting me participate. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a real pleasure to, uh, to engage with the New Zealand founders. Um, we must have met, you know, at least a couple of companies every day since we started, uh, 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 you know, two months ago. And I'm always pleasantly surprised by the energy and passion uh, that I see, and as well as the technical expertise. Um, my background is uh, a lot of it is in banking. I was uh, with the Bank of America Merrill Lynch uh, for about 15 years, uh, actually based in Asia PAC uh, in Tokyo and in Hong Kong. So, and, and I had team in Australia and, and some uh, in New Zealand as well. And so I'm, I'm a little bit familiar with the region and, um, you know, but, um, and then last seven years, I've been in the Bay Area kind of investing in startups. And that's how I met Mark and Glenn. Um, but, you know, engaging with the New Zealand founders has been a breath of fresh air. Um, and, and, you know, and maybe it's related to, like Mark said, the, the Maori culture and its influences uh, is that there's a lot of humility. Um, you know, the Valley founders tend to draw the hockey stick a little too quickly. Uh, whereas, uh, whereas the financial forecast from the Kiwi founders are very measured and very conservative and you have to ask them like, you know, why don't you have the exponential growth and they say they want to have it, but they just don't want to disappoint anyone. Um, so, uh, so it's, it's a very uh, kind of interesting culture to engage with and, and, and certainly one that I admire from a human perspective. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, we are really looking forward to meeting more people, uh, putting more capital to work. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of kind of history of entrepreneurship uh, and innovation. I think the stats are the highest rate of company creation per capita anywhere in the world uh, exists in New Zealand. So, so hats off to that <laughs> entrepreneurial spirit. And uh, we would love to be a part of that. Nice. Yeah, we also probably have the highest... Um a statistic for companies not lasting more than two or three years because <laughs> everyone loves to give it a go. Um, well, we'll try to yeah, change that. Quite, you'll see that. Yeah, exactly. Good good call, AJ. Um, Kyle, you've got a question? Yeah, thank you. Um, this might just be a function of time, but um, I was wondering why you think that uh, there haven't been operator-led funds or um, financing previously uh, and then also uh, how you ex whether you expect that to change in the future um, do you expect more um, previous founders to, to come in and be part of that uh, side of the ecosystem 
Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, I mean, I mean, there, and there's, you know, I think uh, Movac, you know, started by Phil, right, from Trade Me. So, like, I mean, it's it's not exactly like there, there's no operators. It's it's more that, yeah, it's sort of a bit very, very few and they're far between and the majority or not. And, yeah, I think it's exactly because it, similar to kind of the, the the way that Glenn was describing the, the developers, right? It's, it's sort of like it, it needs time for a lot of operators to exit companies for, for you know, to come back. Some portion of them will be interested in doing investing. So it takes time to propagate um, through the ecosystem. Um, and there's only been, you know, kind of, um, you know, maybe a handful of, of significant New Zealand exits, trade me being one of them, um, that, that have, you know, have set up those founders for maybe doing some kind of investing. So, so yeah, I think it's a function of time um, for sure. And I think people understand the value of it, right? Yeah, I, I can add one thing on that just from my Silicon Valley experience. Um, I've dabbled in venture capital as an as an engineer, engineering manager, uh, a couple of times during my thirty years, and 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 now and now I'm doing it. I've been doing it full time now for four years. So this is sort of a different phase now in my life. But in those previous twenty seven years, um, my interactions with the VC, VC community. It, the, the the financial people on AJ can say too. They really have a pretty rigid idea of what a VC should be, in my opinion, too rigid. And you have to really, it's, in order to punch through that and become an investor yourself, you have to really have like either an enormous access or have some sort of unusual access to capital yourself. It's really hard to sell yourself to LPs um, without having sort of the classic MBA route, uh, finance route to being a VC, at least in the Valley. And that's, that's probably true elsewhere. But um, there's been a lot of discussions I've had where right, where I've tried to explore, why don't you bring more actual people who are doing the work, you know, doing, doing, doing the sales, doing the marketing, doing the engineering, you know, why don't you bring them into your, into your, into your firm and really make better decisions. And, and usually yeah. I get that kind of pushback from the, from the more finance oriented people who want to see people who, you know, have gone down the straight MBA path. Right, we're, on, we're on that cusp now though we're, I think we've hit that curve where I think that's going to change because you're getting more founders that are exiting from offshore so they are creating more of those funds I think it just hasn't hit here in New Zealand yet well it has now because we've got you right <laughs> yeah. any other questions yeah I've got one Michelle um, so a question for yeah, for AJ and for Mark, um, are you seeing, AJ, you're seeing, you said you're seeing sort of two, two companies a day. Um, are you seeing any common problems or issues or challenges with those companies um, as opposed to companies you see in the Valley? Are there any common issues, um, you know, um, relevant to New Zealand that would be not sort of uh, commonplace in, in the Valley? Um, I guess... Um, nothing very specific other than the size of the country, I guess, which poses a bit of a problem for the initial plans. Um, so, so as soon as you talk about scaling of the business, you immediately have to start looking at uh, countries outside of New Zealand. So first step being Australia, then, then most people are either talking US or Asia PAC or, or a combination thereof. So I think that creates a little bit of an additional hurdle and maybe uh, related to what Michelle is saying about you know, two to three year lifespan issue is that uh, the, the scaling uh, always requires going global from, <laughs> from the very beginning, right? Uh, and that's something on our website as well. We look for founders who are uh, of the global mindset and, and most of them are. Um, but then by definition, a lot of people would find it easier to grow their initial customer base from what's available locally. Uh, a lot of focus on SMEs, um, which is fine, but then we have to think about how those SME focused businesses can actually engage with SMEs in other countries and which may not be as easy. So a lot of times, you know, the focus can be switched to enterprise doesn't always have to be small organizations uh, that may allow for a better global scaling. So yeah, I think that's that's perhaps the, the biggest uh, and the most unique challenge that we see coming out of uh, New Zealand. And, and you know, when we compare uh, the stage of the ecosystem where New Zealand is, we, we think it's like Israel five years ago and they have a very similar issue. Um, and the way they get around that is by building a tremendous bridge uh, with, with the US, particularly Silicon Valley, um, and, and having a you know, lot of back and forth, both, um, both as founders and investors, um, and also kind of 
you know, bringing the most technical people uh, into the fold. Uh, so in terms of technical expertise of the founders, you really find some of the top notch people of Israel uh, running those companies. And I think that's sort of what we are seeing uh, in New Zealand as well, in terms of technical talent, uh, rather than working for a large organization doing, uh, doing a startup. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are kind of some of the challenges we see, nothing that cannot be overcome. And in there, I'm sure lies a, an opportunity. Um, like we have seen with Zero and, and Rocket Labs. Mm, true, true. Um, yeah, I can add just one thing to that if, if, yeah. if you want. I, AJ and I see a lot of companies here. We've, um, I think we've seen probably close to 600 companies this year, just if you count, if you count seeing just a demo day pitch. So like we've seen like 300 demo day pitches from Y Combinator alone and one, you know, one, uh, one complete, you know, eight hour <laughs> day, <laughs> like a minute each, two minutes each. But uh, I would say my overwhelming reaction is that the distribution of companies that we've seen so far in New Zealand, maybe maybe close to 100 total, maybe maybe 30 more in depth, um, is very similar actually to the distribution of companies um, in, that I've seen in the US. I would say overwhelmingly, it's 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 right in the zone. I don't think there's any real, um, and that's probably a good thing. I don't think there's any real characteristic that I could think of. Other than, other than like AJ said, the, the local markets. Some companies have a local market focus, but other than that, I think it looks right right in the zone. Thanks, Glenn. Um, Richard, you've got a question? Yeah, um, I don't know who this is for, but I'm, I'm working with a few small businesses and you know I'm uh, helping operate a little bit. Some of them I help invest in. Mm -hmm. Um, there's this one that I have a situation with and I was wondering if maybe somebody could direct me in the right direction. Um, basically it's a Maori uh, school teacher um, that I've been working with for years and we bang software out, you know, just for fun. Um, and we, we created a learning management system, you know, kind of just for anybody. You know, kind of based on the Maori ITL typical uh, curricula. So you create your own curriculum type thing. But we don't know if we'll ever find product market for something, but he would really like to start a business. And I'm not uh, super experienced in that, finding product market fit, really understanding how to do market analysis. So at so early stage, you know, we have like these little internal toys that we're playing with that I don't know if it'd be the right time to talk to someone here or if it'd be better for us to do seek some help somewhere else um, so that, that that's what I'm if and if nobody has an answer on that that's fine you know, I'm just throwing it out if, yeah I'll just quickly on that then Mark you can go have you um looked at any of the incubators and places like that and at which city is are they based in uh, we're based in Palmy, uh, in, in my, uh, uh, collaborators based in Palmy. I'm in Takika, so we're just kind of all over the place. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, um, I think it's an incubator might not be right right now because we're both really full time. Mm. Um, and we want to kind of get to the point where we're trying to decide, should we, should we go forward with this and, and, you know, moving in from his full-time position into uh, a business leadership position um, or, you know, is the market not, is it too early, too late? You know, what, what is the, what does the market say is what we'd like to answer before we. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, Richard, I think, um, I think there's probably a good number of resources out there that, they could probably help you. Uh, Paul Graham has a bunch of stuff. Um, my Combinator website has a bunch of stuff around um, around finding you know, product market fit, thinking about you know, how to think about that. I think Michelle's point is also really great about you know just you know any, any incubators that that um, and a lot of them are you know have plenty of resources online, right? So this this is a problem that I think a lot of folks um, have faced. So yeah, I think you'll find resources online. Um, and, and, and please reach out to us. Actually, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, there's there's somebody yeah talking about Steve Blank and Udacity course, um, yeah so, so definitely a lot of stuff um, and if you can't find anything you can reach out to, to us and we'd be happy to send you some stuff. 
I would say one note of caution on incubators, they're generally generally great. Just be a little careful of what you give away in the agreement. Just read the fine print a little carefully. There are, I don't know about New Zealand, but certainly in some of the outer areas here, like in LA, Boulder, you know, Austin, Texas, some of the non-Silicon Valley areas, non-Boston areas, you can get pretty aggressive terms from an incubator. So just go in with your eyes open. I would totally recommend an incubator accelerator program. Just be a little careful. Don't, especially the kind of clause that, that could catch founders is the one that guarantees a percent of the company for the incubator post funding. They'll write these clauses that are basically terrible, I think, but they'll say, we're going to own 15% of your company. Um, not just, not just post money in, in a YC safe note sense, but post your actual seed financing, which really handicaps your ability to raise money. So that's my only little caveat on that. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, we're pouring over the Y Combinator stuff right now, and uh, we'll we'll look for incubators. Yeah, and the the comment here about the no the non equity incubators, awesome. Go for those. The Stardex here right at Stanford, just right two miles from where I'm pointing, um, is an is a non equity incubator, and they are great. You get probably a lot from them, and you pay zero equity for it. <laughs> yeah, there are a few of those in um, in New Zealand, as Paul was saying. Yeah. That'd be a, a really good list of resources for fellows, you know, like the, the, you know, incubators that don't take equity or something. Yeah, there's a, there is a list on our homepage and under the fellows welcome area, Richard, of all the different um, incubators in that New Zealand, not necessarily which ones do take in, um, equity or not, but we can point into that after. But it is going to be tough. I think you probably do. One of you needs to go full time. You know, it's probably pretty tough to crack a market, especially a market like that. that's crowded with a lot of players, even though if you have great stuff, it's not something it's not like a unique. Well, well unless it is like a unique patent that you have on some specific gizmo that you could do kind of part time. If it's more like just grind it out and sell something against somebody else who's already got a solution that might have a lot of the same features, you know, then it's going to be a, it's going to be a a whole process. So I'd, I'd say probably you probably you can't do it without without at least somebody going full time on it. We would be my gut, my gut reaction. Great. Thanks, Paul. Just mm -hmm. conscious of my time. Can I just say as well? Yeah, go for <laughs> Sorry, it. I was, I was just gonna say one last, one last. Yeah. Go for <laughs> it. Oh, I was just gonna say for Richard, I'm a founder who's had a bunch of experience with different incubators, accelerators in New Zealand. So if you want to have a chat, um, then just happy to talk about that. Oh yeah, that would be awesome, man. Um, from a, I'll, yeah, I'll, from uh, that would be so cool. I'll I'll, I'll ping you. That would be awesome. Okay. Thank you. Just... Cool. Well, if there's no other questions, we'll leave it there, team. Thank you for coming, and we've got some pretty cool um, investor fellows coming up in the next few months. We're going to have Aaron Bird's going to do a session. We're going to have a couple of the fellows from in the Asian markets, and hopefully. We might be able to get um, uh, one of the guys coming in from. He was started. He did the search engine for Google, and then now he's he was in with Skype, and so I think and he's based up in Europe. So that'll have to be a very early one in the morning. Maybe about an eight o'clock session is probably what we'll do, so that we can do it. But I think it'll be a really great um, conversation to see how a, a deep dive goes. Um, so thanks for coming, team, and appreciate Mark you coming and showing up and doing all the good work that you're doing and you, your team also for coming it's great to actually see who's behind behind the fund sort of the manager i think it's great so thanks guys aj and uh, glenn and we'll see you next time thank you guys thanks team, thanks, team. Yeah. Bye.